Good, let's have a prayer. Father God, thank you for this opportunity again that I can meet with my brother and have the, this discussion regarding this course for uh, ethnography. Lord, I pray that um, you bless our time, guide and lead us as your blessing upon my brother and his family. And Lord, protect him, protect them, uh, whether in this class or other classes, uh, may you bless uh, other students, all of them in whatever they do, Lord, and may your name be glorified. We remember Nathan and pray for him. Um, uh, watch over him and his family and use him and keep him usable for spreading the gospel and sharing your precious gospel with other people. Uh, help both of them uh, in uh, as they do their assignment and get prepared for the ethnography project thesis. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Sorry, I'm a few minutes late. It's okay. uh, how, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Good, good, good. How I notice. Good, good. I'm okay. Um, I noticed that you uh, turn in your assignment for the last week. Um, I haven't taken take a look at them yet, but I'm sure they are fine. Uh, but please pay attention to my notes and the remarks I make. If you have any question, feel free to ask anything you want to ask. Okay. Uh, I was wondering if we could talk just a little bit more about syncretism. Okay. Uh, sure. You know, yeah. The, you see, the difference between syncretism and contextualization, uh, some people... Uh, I remember back in the uh, 80s when these uh, there was a debate in the uh, among missiologists regarding contextualization and syncretism. Um, uh, there was a lots of discussion, uh, especially in the area of the Muslim ministry, because of a books by a man named Phil Partial. Now, and now I don't recommend him. I mean, for me, that's a, a typical example of syncretism. Um, um, now, and let me give you a few things that shows why I consider that as syncretic. Uh, like he was thinking that in order to quote unquote, make the gospel more acceptable for the Muslim, for uh, we should uh, avoid some terminology and use some Islamic terminology, such as instead of calling the church church, Church of Christ, Church of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, let's call it the Mosque of Jesus. <laughs> or um, even uh, in not him, but some other people who were taken up by him and they were, you know, kind of impressed by what he was saying and they were thinking, oh, this is the key to reaching out to the Muslim. Uh, we're saying that let's do away with baptism because. Mm -hmm baptism causes a, a Muslim convert, a, per, a person from Muslim background to be alienated from his or her society. Well, I call these things syncretism. Uh, uh, and you, you see, usually syncretism comes to play in the fields that are difficult, such as the Muslim ministry or any other field that are difficult and Christian missionaries have a struggle throughout centuries to reach out to these people, then there is a tendency to move towards syncretism, tendency to try to, uh, quote unquote, uh, make the gospel more acceptable to them. Um, you know, if we, if our goal is in contextualization and especially in critical contextualization, what Dr. Hibbert in his book talks about is, yes, if we want to make the gospel understandable for a Muslim, I'm all for it. Uh, a Muslim person or a Hindu or whoever, uh, if, we, if we are, our goal is to try uh, the gospel more understandable for such a person, so, so that, for example, the ter terms such as 
son of God are not confusing or are not misleading. We are not talking about any physical relationship between God and Mary or anybody else. We are not talking or thinking in physical terms. Um, it's a spiritual term and has a spiritual meaning. Um, if, uh, you know, in critical contextualization, they take terms such as son of God, they don't change it, but they define it. Uh, there is a definition for it. Uh, they don't try to come up with something else. Um, <laughs> um, let me give you another example of syncretism. It, you know, it, it can penetrate into all kind of biblical fields, such as translation of the scripture. I do know, <laughs> it may sound kind of funny, and it's actually sad, uh, some translator who were uh, working among the Eskimos, and they were, you know, they were thinking, well, they never seen the Eskimos, never seen a lamb. So let's substitute uh, for instead of, for example, a lamb, some kind of uh, animals that they are familiar with, walrus or seal. Mm -hmm. But that that's that's ridiculous, you know. So what do you call the lamb of God, the walrus of God, the seal of God? I mean, it becomes ridiculous. Mm -hmm. What do you do? Critical contextualization. Uh, comes and uh, understands that uh, uh, Eskimo doesn't know, maybe never seen a lamb in his, his or her life, but we can define it. Uh, especially nowadays with the digital technology, you can have a picture. Uh, this is a lamb. It looks like this as an animal, four legs, has wool, usually white, and has these benefits and uh, give a little history of lamb being sacrificed because lamb typically signify innocence. So the idea is that there must be an innocent sacrifice, innocent substitute for us, uh, we as a sinner. So you, you define it, you explain it. You don't try to change that terminology. Um, and many other terminology is such that. I remember one time I was at uh, at the library at Trinity, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, where I did my Master of Divinity. And I was reading this magazine. Uh, it was published by Islamic group. And they specifically put their fingers on these issues. They were warning people. They were saying, watch out for these Christian missionaries, they will come and they try to use these terms such as mosque of Jesus or try to, or other Islamic terminologies, um, try to um, attract you toward Christianity, be aware of them. And then the author uh, had a challenge and I, I thought he's right. You know, he, he's right on this point. He said, I don't understand why Christians are ashamed of their faith. If you are a Christian, come and say it, and don't try to hide under Islamic uh, terminologies. Uh, and you know, to be honest with you, I think he's right. Why are we trying to hide? Um, and uh, you know, but of course, the you know the concept of critical contextualization is you look at a culture, you under, you become aware that terms such as son of God, lamb of God, other things can be uh, confusing, misleading, trinity. Uh, so you define it, you explain it in a way that uh, a person in that culture can understand it. But we don't change the term. Uh, we don't change the text of the scripture. We don't come and do away with the baptism. Okay, yes, of course, baptism. Yes, that's true. Baptism uh, most of the time causes the Christian that the convert to be eliminate, uh, uh, alienated uh, from his or so her society. That's true. But we are, we, we are not supposed to uh, come and change it. You know, it's the part of the cost of discipleship, cost of taking up our cross and following Jesus. Uh, the cross of Jesus is a stumbling block and we are not supposed to kind of make it 
uh, more uh, user friendly. It, it is. It's a symbol of debt, debt to sin, debt to ourself, and uh, living for God. Um, so that's what I mean by syncretism, and not me, most of the missiologists, is mixing a scripture. You see, you can have uh, the tree, I think three level. You can uh, totally reject the culture and say, no, uh, I'm not going to uh, uh, change anything. Uh, this is it, whether they like it or not. And we are not asking to change anything, but okay, I'm going to just present it uh, like a King James version, uh, whether they understand it, they don't, they don't, that's their problem. Well, that causes, um, they don't get it. They don't understand what you're talking about. Then the, there's, uh, there's other extreme that tries to accept everything and tries to, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, adopt Christianity into uh, their Islamic culture or Hindu culture or Buddhist, whatever. That's wrong too. We go critical contextualization. We look at the culture. We um, test that culture, the different parts, elements of that culture uh, with the scripture. If it is against the scripture, yes, it must be rejected. If it can be redeemed, we try to redeem it uh, or redeem it, change it, and adopt it. Um, let me give you one more example of that. Uh, here in our church, Iranian Church of San Diego, uh, Iranian have a New Year celebration in spring. Actually, is a spring equinox. In, or it's around March 20, 22nd. It changes depending on the day of the equinox where when the spring starts. And there's a celebration for that. Uh, we, we do celebrate that in our church. Now, I know the roots of it is comes from an ancient uh, religion called Zoroastrianism. Now, we don't advocate Zoroastrianism, Zoroastrianism. We don't try to mix it with uh, Christian faith. Uh, but what we do is, for example, one of the things that they have in the Iranian New Year there is a table that they set a table with seven different items that they start with the letter S in the Persian language, like a grass symbol of the, we hope that this year would be a, uh, the year of lots of rainfall and great harvest, things, different things like that. Okay, we, we put that there, but... We don't look at uh, to God of Zoroastrianism for blessing. We look to Heavenly Father. We ask blessing from God the Father. And uh, we definitely don't put the book of uh, Avesta, which is the religious book of Zoroastrianism, or, or the Quran on the table. We put the Bible. And we ask the blessing uh, uh, from God the Father, it start the name, it start the year, in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we take a custom from a culture, modify it, and adopt it into Persian Christian culture. So that's what I mean, differences between syncretism and critical contextualization. Yes, yeah. thank you. Sure. I have another question. Sure. I'm just... I'd like to know your thoughts on uh, the, I've heard some, I read some books saying how God the Father has, has uh, left traces or left kind of potential bridges to the gospel in, in different cultures. Of course, yes, definitely. In fact, you know, uh, I, I think I mentioned that in your assignments, uh, yeah, in your in your assignments, in your ministry reports, especially when you're writing on um, social distinctiveness of your target people. I believe I have mentioned that. What we call that is um, there's a, a the redemptive analogies, redemptive analogies, and that term came became popular with the book. 
peace child mm-hmm. back in the, I think, early 80s. Uh, the, P- the, war, the book uh, by Richardson, I think it was the author, Peace Child. And it's an excellent book. And you see, it's a concept like, the, like in his experience in the tribal uh, culture, the concept of a, a having a, a child from one tribe to live among another, another tribe to maintain the peace between these two tribes. Yes, there are, uh, you know, and I encourage all of you guys to always look for these things. Uh, now, don't <laughs> don't fake it. You know, don't fabricate those uh, uh, um, analogies. But if there are things like that, you can use it. Like, give you an example in the Islamic culture. Uh, one of the custom I remember that as a as a as a kid, I remember my dad doing that. When they buy a home, a new home. They sacrifice a lamb and they give the meat to neighbors and they put the blood of the lamb on their doorpost. Now, when you ask them why or even not only home, uh, I remember when my my dad bought a new car, they sacrifice a lamb and then they put the blood of the lamb on the car's tire. (laughs) And you, you ask them, you know, well, why do we, why are we doing these things? They say just for blessing and keeping a very bad omen. Now, think of it. Where does this come from? That comes, you know, it's, um, that's come from Old Testament, from uh, Exodus chapter 12, uh, from, you know, the Passover, when the Lord commanded Moses to tell to Israelite, uh, for the last plague that he was going to uh, kill the firstborn of the Egyptian, just sacrifice a lamb and put the blood on your doorpost. So when I see the blood, I will pass over that house. Uh, you know, they do that. So there are these, um, they don't know where does it come from. They have absolutely no idea of the roots of it going to the book of Exodus and <laughs> Exodus of the Israelite from Egypt, but that's there. That's an excellent thing to start the conversation. And there are many, in many cultures, you can find such analogies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, what I've come across a few times is in, in Tanzania, I have one friend who had a similar analogy in his culture where his in his culture if there was a a fight or something between two two men and if blood was spilled then to resolve the fight they would have to to spill the blood of a lamb or or a a sacrifice or something yeah that's it that's a redemptive analogy why to in order to bring peace why should there be a sacrifice why should blood be shed and why lamb why not something else you know that's the key you know another example in almost all middle eastern culture uh, there is this custom somehow they have this such a reverence for bread for bread you know uh, other things other meat other types of food fruits I am. I mean, we are not supposed to waste it, or but I mean, it's kind of okay. It fell to the ground. That's fine. I'll let it go. But bread, no. I mean, if in 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 uh, now, of course, lots of cultures have changed with the modern media and technology. But typically, if a bread was fallen on the floor, they will pick it up. They will try to um, uh, they they. they uh, clean it and even kiss it and sometimes put it on their forehead and then put it somewhere on a table or somewhere uh, to be kept clean. Why bread? Why bread has such an importance? Uh, Why not something else? Uh, I think the roots of it goes to the communion, uh, to Lord's communion. This is my body. 
unknowingly they have such a reverence for bread. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I encourage you, uh, and Nathan, uh, if he ever watches this video, uh, when you do your uh, social studies, uh, definitely look for redemptive analogy. Even here, even in 611, and definitely as you go to, uh, uh, when we go to 651, uh, on the on the chapter because you want one, one chapter of your thesis would be social study of your target people look for these tar uh, redemptive analogies. You also see that if with with the redemptive analogies and some of these things, do you see if there is any danger that they could lead to syncretism as well? Sure. Yes, yes, of course. That's why we define it. You know, that's why I start with questions. I challenge, you know, the way, for example, the concept of the blood that when they buy a new house, they put the blood on their door, doorpost, is to ask them, why? Why are you doing this? Where does this tradition come from? And what is it in the blood that can turn away curse or omen or evil eye? Why, why? Um, and why a blood of lamb? Why don't we do that for chicken <laughs> um, or something else? Why lamb? Why lamb? And you can take it then from there and go to the gospel. Mm -hmm. You know, syncretism can uh, creep in if you don't take it to the gospel, but you can take these elements and, and tell them, okay, now let me tell you, uh, what I believe is the, the truth behind this tradition, where it comes from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Sure, sure. Great. Anything else? Those are all my questions for today. Good. Good. That's fantastic. Please have these questions. I, I would love to have this discussion. Great, brother. Well, you are doing fine. And, you know, the, the syllabus, I think, is self-explanatory. And just keep on going and, uh, uh, and look for these redemptive analogies. And, you know, um, then you are building up your materials for your thesis. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Then if nothing else, let's close our time with a prayer. Can I ask you to pray for us and end our time? Dear God, thank you for this time that we can have to visit about these things, God. We just thank you for salvation that you made available to us, God. And we just thank you for how you're drawing people from all, all people, all languages and, and, and people groups around the world, God. And just thank you that we can play a small part in that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, brother. Have a great week, and Lord's willing, I will see you next week. All right, you too. Have a good week. Take care. Bye-bye.